Faith Impact Church. We're so blessed to have you with us in our service this morning. This is Faith Impact Church. We're here in Georgetown, Texas. If you're not a part of our body and maybe uh, viewing for the first time, so we want to welcome you to um, enjoy the praise and worship that we're going to be doing in just a few moments. Our worship team is here, and we appreciate them coming and being a part of this. And uh, also uh, all of our staff that's here to record and do the things that are necessary to do. But first of all, I would ask you to do something uh, for me. I would ask uh, you to pray for um, Larry and Nadine Davis. Uh, Larry uh, lost his mom uh, just uh, the other day. And um, so I'd like us just to pray for him to begin this service and, and to minister. She was a Christian. She loved Jesus. You know, we don't have any question about where Miss Gladys is. Um, uh, we've had many conversations with her about that. And uh, so we know where she is. Um, it's just the fact that um, it's his mom, and uh, we love him and his and Miss Nadine, and we just want to lift their family up. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you would comfort and minister this family. I thank you, Father, in this time of, of grief and uh, this time of separation, but knowing this, that, Lord, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and we know one day that we'll all be reunited with each other in heaven, and it'll be a grand time of rejoicing. And so I thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit. He is our comforter, and he is our minister. He ministers to our hearts and to our minds, to our souls, and we thank you for that in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got to tell you this. Um, it's been, uh, it's been uh, and I know I've talked to a lot of pastors, it's been kind of tough on pastors because um, uh, uh, we are missing our people. We feel like a, um, a shepherd without sheep here and uh, preaching to uh, basically an empty building. And, uh, but, you know, I was uh, thinking, I was, and, and Pastor Marsh had, when we were talking about this, you know, uh, Paul, uh, Paul uh, many times felt the same way when he was separated from the people. And I just want to read to you a scripture out of Philippians. And if you're familiar with uh, Paul and his relationship with the Philippians, very dear church to his heart. But uh, I want to read a couple of scriptures here. It says, uh, he says in verse, uh, verse 7, he said, or verse 6, I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue unto the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing into full completion in you. It is right and appropriate for me to have this confidence and to feel this way about you, because even as you do me, I hold you in my heart as partakers and sharers, one and all with me of God's grace and unmerited favor. This is true both when I'm shut up and when I am out uh, preaching the good news. And I thought, you know, um, even Paul understood when he missed the people. And I want you to know we love to preach the word of God, but we miss you. And uh, so we've got some special announcements that we're going to make at the end of the service today. Be sure to, to stay tuned in. And uh, are you ready to worship the Lord? We want to worship the Lord this morning. We want to magnify him in your home today. You can lift your hands up. You can begin to magnify him, begin to praise him, begin to sing along as they worship the Lord today. God bless you. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Let's just stand and just lift our hands before the Lord. We thank you, Father, for your presence here, and we just magnify you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God is fighting for us. Amen. Come on, lift your voices and sing. God is fighting for us. God is on our side. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be Jesus, you are here. God is fighting for us. God is fighting for us. God is on our side. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. 
for the Holy Spirit's presence here. Amen. Yes, Lord. but our worship. Because as we worship you, we realize you're greater than any problem. You're greater than any virus. You're greater than any sickness. For you are the God Almighty. You are our healer, our deliverer, the one who sets us free, Lord. We thank you that we do not walk in fear, but we walk in faith, knowing that you have our lives in your very hands. We give you glory and honor for what you're doing in each home that's listening and receiving this word today. 
We give you glory because we know the healer is in the house. Yes, the house is not this building. Hallelujah. The house is our body. No, and the Holy not. Spirit, Temple. who is the greater one, <laughs> indwells us. And he puts us Hallelujah. over. We thank you that the very healer, the yes. spirit of the living God, lives inside of us. Yes. And we thank you for that. Yes. And we give you glory and honor. Hallelujah. 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 Body of Hallelujah. Christ, we're coming to you today. Ooh. And I'm going to, to tell God. you, there's a young boy. And he is a grandson of one of our members. Our members are Norm and Allura Johns. And he's in Germany. He's eight years old. And he's been diagnosed with a brain tumor, actually two brain tumors. And there's, they're not, they haven't gotten the results back yet, but you know how the doctors are. And they say, we think it's cancer. But you know what? Allura and, and Norm are standing in faith with Amen. all of their family. Thank you, Father. And I told Allura yesterday, we are going to get an agreement, and we're going to run the devil right out of that place. They're over there, and uh, with this virus going on, the the coronavirus is in Germany. It's uh, as bad as it is here, whether they tell you it is or not. And there, he's in the hospital, and the parents can only go in one at a time to see him. And this little eight-year-old boy, anytime one of them leaves, they're frightened. He gets real frightened. So we just want to come against yes, any fear. fear in that precious little boy. His name is Henry. Everybody Henry. say Henry. 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 Henry, Henry you, we're going to pray for you today. Yes, amen. And we're believing God yes, that hallelujah. whatever that is that's a t that, uh, on your brain is going to be gone. Yes. It's going to leave so his body. It's going to dissolve. You are healed in Jesus' name. So Pastor, you want to come and pray with me on this one? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise you. We Amen. want your agreement. Amen. We do want your agreement on that. You know, the, uh, the other night, um, uh, 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 Lure had talked to us, and, and so we got up in the middle, and I was, there were six hours ahead, and we just began to pray and intercede for a little over an hour, just praying while they were doing the surgery and going in there. And uh, we're just believing God. You know, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's but right. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and life more abundantly. There's a scripture that, um, that God has given to me. And it's one of those, I call it a stake that you drive into the ground and you mm -hmm. hold on to. And mm -hmm. it's in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10. It says that we would lay the axe to the root of that thing and cast it back into the pit from whence it's come. That's right. See, that did not come from heaven. That tumor did not come from heaven. That tumor came from the devil. He came from the enemy who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is interceding right now. I believed as we prayed the other night, I saw that thing dying at the very root. Hallelujah. And I, I declare with my mouth and I de what it is in my heart that that thing is dissolved in Jesus' name, that he is healed. And Father, we declare Henry to be healed in Jesus' name, whose report shall we believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. I pray for those parents that they will stand fast yes, on the Lord. word of Thank God. You, I pray for the grandparents, Father, as they you, intercede yes. and stand fast with them, Father God. I thank you for this church, Lord, as we stand fast with them and intercede for them. We thank you, Lord God, that you are moving mightily in this young man's, uh, his life. In the name of yes, Jesus, Lord. we give you thanksgiving for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. God. So Henry's healed in Jesus' name. Henry's healed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. God. Well, thank you so much, uh, worship team. We appreciate it very much. Hey, you know, today is kind of a special day. I, I know it's, um, it's the triumphal entry, and we're going to talk about that here this morning about Jesus. But today is actually um, a very special day at Faith Impact Church. Today is our 10-year anniversary. We have God, 10 years ago, instructed us to come to Georgetown to start a church. And I asked the Lord, I said, why, why start another church, you know? And he gave us, a, he gave us an, um, a, a declaration, I believe, would be to, to do this. He said that you are to have a church that is founded upon the uncompromised Word of God. So the Word of God is the foundation of this church. And secondly, that we are a spirit-filled church. We mean, by that we mean the, the Holy Spirit that was poured out in the book of Acts 
The book of Acts has not ended. The book of Acts is still operating today. The miracles, the signs and wonders, the healings, the deliverance, the things that, how Jesus set people free the, through the disciples and others, uh, that is still going on today. And so uh, we have established this church, Faith Impact Church. In our newsletter this past week, I, I put in a couple of pictures. Uh, you probably are only seeing this, uh, this sanctuary here, but um, um, I look out here and I see Miss Jan. Miss Jan, I put a picture on there uh, when we were at 505 West University and um, the ugly uh, red and gray carpet that was in there. And I, rem- I have pictures of different ones in our church patching the holes in the walls. I've never seen so many holes in a walls in walls in a building and uh, we enjoyed that for 6 years. We were blessed with that, by that. Uh, we were uh, down on 1907 South Austin Avenue. Uh, before that that's where we actually began the church. And uh uh, and so we were blessed. We actually started it on Easter Sunday uh, in 2010, and uh, God just uh, directed us to do that. So today's uh, an anniversary for us, and we were going to have a big cake and uh, all the punch and all those good things. Uh, well, we're going to have that when we come back together, all right? We're not going to miss an opportunity to celebrate that, and uh, we are excited about that. So praise God. Uh, lots and lots of good things going on. <clears throat> I want to minister the Word of God to you this morning, and if you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to the book of Matthew, and I want to share uh, something on the uh, Jesus coming into Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And you know, um, I know there's lots of different folks that are watching today, and thank you so much for for staying tuned with us and and to listen to the Word of God. It's so important that we hear the word. It's so important that the word is uh, an important part of our lives and um, everything that, that God does for us, every promise that he has is in this word. And so this morning as we come to his word and we read his word, if you have your, ba- your Bibles there and it can be on your phone, it can be on your tablet, it can be a, a, a Bible like I have here. This is my Bible. How do you know that, Pastor? I wrote my name on the front of it, okay? So, so nobody can take my Bible. But in Matthew, uh, if you would turn to Matthew with me, Matthew chapter 21, and I want to begin reading in verse 1. Before I do, though, let me just say this. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the empowerment of your word, that it transcends location, that, Father, the word that we minister this morning goes further than this building, but it goes into the very homes. It goes into the very hearts and minds of people. And I declare, Father God, that the word of God will have an input into their lives. That they will hear the word. And out of the word that they hear, faith will rise up to cast out all fear that is in their life. All depression that is in their life. All discouragement that is in their life. And I thank you, Father God, that the word of God shall accomplish that which it's sent forth to do. To bring forth hope. To bring forth faith to bring forth encouragement Lord and I declare with my mouth Father God what I believe in my heart that the word of God will have an impact on the people that are hearing this word today and I thank you for that Father God we give you praise and glory for this time of the year when we when we talk about uh, the the in the entry of Jesus into Jeru- Jerusalem and into this holy week uh, of resurrection week, uh, of resurrection day on next Sunday. And we thank you, Father God, for the input of your word, that it will change lives, that it will open prison gates, it will set the, the captives free, Father God. Whatever addictive personality, whatever addictive thing in their life, that it will set them free today, Father God. Because Jesus did this, uh, which we shall hear today, because he loves us. And that love is demonstrated. He didn't just say it with his words, but he did it through his actions. He demonstrated his love to us. I thank you, Father God, that you will minister the hearts of each and every individual. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. And when they drew near nigh to Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, 
unto the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go unto the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a colt and, 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 a, um, and a, a donkey and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man ought unto you or ask you why, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled by that which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And he brought the donkey and the colt and put them in their clothes upon them and set him thereupon. And a very great multitude spread out their garments on the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewn them in the way. And the multitudes that went before that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the name of the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God. This morning, I want to share some things with you, some scenes uh, from this entry of Jesus into uh, this, what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, If you could have been in Jerusalem that day, it would have been like you were at a festival. It is the end of the week. It is the time when they have come in for Passover. The people from the country have brought their animals. The people in the city are buying the animals to sacrifice, to, uh, to uh, uh, share in the Passover week that is there. And it was a, it was a very... Um, a time of, of laughing and joyous, and, and you could hear, you could see the multitude. So, uh, someone had said that there were over 110,000 people that had gathered in Jerusalem uh, at that time. It was uh, a beginning, a, a scene of a lot of joy and a lot of smiling and, 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 and friends getting together that hadn't seen each other uh, for a while. And, uh, and so here is Jesus, and Jesus comes riding in. And Jesus has an entourage, as we would call it today. Uh, those were those buddies that followed him. And uh, so you see this entourage. Here's Jesus and his disciples. And they're walking with him and they're praising God. Some of the Pharisees wanted to say, uh, quit saying that. Don't say that Jesus made them quit saying that you are the king of kings. Behold the king. And Jesus refused to do that. He knew what the prophet had said. And so here you have uh, uh, the disciples, James and John, Peter, Thomas, Andrew, Judas, You see Mary, his mother, and Mary and Martha, and his brother who Jesus had raised from the dead. And there were shouts of victory and praise. This was like the culmination, literally the very culmination of the ministry of Jesus Christ. For three and a half years, he had had been teaching the Word of God. He had been to Jerusalem, but never like this. When this this crowd was there, there was such a a, a ramped up of emotion and and feelings that were going on uh, in this time. There were shouts of victory for all the miracles, the blind, the healed, the deaf here, the dead are raised to life, people are delivered from demons, leopards are made whole to the name just a few. There were shouts of echoing from the crowd and a lot of singing, high-fiving, a lot of chanting, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I can hear it as we were walking along. I can hear the crowd begin to chant, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Many of them not knowing the word that they were saying. Many of them not understanding what was even in that name. They had heard about it. They had come to see the myth. This man that had been around the countryside preaching the gospel, this man who had healed uh, all of these and and, and, and as Jesus comes riding in. One of the things I, I think about, and as I, I guess uh, <clears throat> I had, a, <clears throat> I would call it an epiphany this week, in that I took my eyes off of all of the crowd for a moment, and I looked at the man that was riding on the colt. And I looked at him, and as I looked at him, I saw Jesus looking at the people. 
I thought to myself, what is it that Jesus sees when he looks at people? Earlier this week, I had been studying <clears throat> in uh, the book of Mark, and I, I came across the, the story of the, the rich young ruler. You remember who came to Jesus, and he said, you know, uh, what must I do to inherit life? And, and, uh, and Jesus told him all these things, and, and he said, but I've done all these things. He was feeling pretty good. When we would look at that young man, we would see a, um, a young man that's successful. His speech says that he's educated. Uh, he, he is, the clothes that he's wearing says that, that he is a, a prosperous person. And, and we would look on the natural, we'd look on the, the outside. But Jesus, when he looks, what does Jesus see? What does Jesus see? And Jesus did not look at the outward man. He looked at the heart of that young man. I, I, I believe that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, there's a scripture in, in Matthew, in, uh, um, in Luke, I mean, and it says this right here, that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. I believe he wept because he looked into the faces of the people that were there. I wrote down, I, I thought, you know, here, if, if, if I were Jesus and, and I were looking out, here is what I believe that he saw. I, I believe that he saw people <clears throat> who showed on their face all the wrong choices that they'd made in life. I believe that he would have seen people addicted to stuff and how they were trapped in addictions. I believe he saw happy people too. I believe that he saw families together. But I also believe he saw families that were broken apart. I believe when Jesus looked at the people, he saw people stressed, discouraged, some of them afraid, some of them fearful. But one of the things that I believe with Jesus is that every face had a story. You know, I've asked the Lord when we get to heaven that if we could maybe spend the first 10,000 years just simply going around to each one of us and, and, and allowing us to share our story. For every human being on this earth that is born into this earth has a story. I'm looking at these faces and I can tell you there's a story behind every face. And I believe when Jesus looked, he didn't look at the outward. He saw the person that was the inner. Each face had a divine destiny to be achieved or thrown away. Each face was created in the image of God. Each face was unique and different. None of us are exactly alike. Some of us have more hair than others. Some of us, you know, are built taller than others. Some of us are built shorter than others. And, 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 and every one of us are unique with God. Each face represents hopes and dreams. Each face with the story to tell. And I believe that when Jesus began to look at the people in the crowd that day, I believe something happened. I believe the people that he saw, and, and I went back and I thought, okay, now who would Jesus see in that crowd? This is Passover, so who would Jesus see in that crowd? So I, I wrote some of them down. How about the two blind men that Jesus healed? Do you think they'd have been in that crowd? How about this, right? How about the boy that was delivered from the evil spirit? Remember? I believe he would have been in that crowd, him and his dad. How about the crippled woman that was healed on the Sabbath? Do you think she would have been in that crowd? I do. <clears throat> How about the Canaanite woman? that was healed. How about some of the 5,000 that Jesus fed that day when he, on the Sermon on the Mount, when he preached to them and, he, and then he fed the multitudes? Or some of that 3,000 that were there that day when he fed them and ministered the word of God? How about this? Do you think Zacchaeus would have been there? You know, the little guy that climbed up in the tree to see Jesus, the tax collector. Do you believe he was there that day? See, I, I, as I'd be, I, and, and I, I, I looked at Jesus and I saw Jesus looking at the woman Beside him, his mom, Mary, was there. I see Jesus seeing the leper. Oh, wait a minute, it's only one of the ten. But the leper would have been there, the one that came back. And Jesus said, not only are you healed, but you're saved. That leper came back. 
I see some others. I see some of the 70 that he sent out. And, and they declared, even the demons uh, are afraid of us as we begin to preach in your name. And I see Jairus uh, of the synagogue uh, who, who he had raised the daughter from the dead. The centurion who, uh, whose servant that he had sent his word and healed him. The widow whom Jesus had raised her son from the dead? Or how about the man that was healed of leprosy or the paralytic that was healed through the lowering of the season of the ceiling? Don't you think they would have been there? Him and his friends would have been there as well. There's a statement I read, and I've got to share this with you because I believe this is a great statement. Grace is unconditionally given, but intimacy must be relentlessly pursued. Grace is unconditionally given. And I believe the grace of God, thank you, Father, that we live in a time when we understand the grace of God is poured out. And, the, and we love the grace of God poured out. Of, but it's more than the grace of God. The grace of God simply brings us to that position of relationship in Christ. But it is, is, is that relentless pursuit of intimacy that brings us into that fellowship that, had, that we can have with Jesus Christ. So I, I took this multitude of people that was there that day, and I began to, to, uh, to look at them. And I did this right here, I, 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 and I believe there were thousands and thousands of people that were gathered there. And so I began to, to start at the outer ring, and I did, you know what concentric circles are? You know, one and then another one, and then and closer in and closer in. And so I, I took, and I'm thinking of this, because I believe Jesus it is I believe Jesus is a God of relationship, amen? I mean, he wants to have a relationship with each one of us. And as we draw closer to him, that relationship becomes stronger, that fellowship becomes uh, stronger with him. I believe that the crowd represented, uh, and, and if we were talking about this outer ring, uh, the, the tens of thousands of people that were there, uh, the crowd represented those who followed Jesus to the places and, and, and were watching and, and listening. Uh, they don't really know him, uh, but they, they've heard some things about him, uh, and so they want to find out who is this, what's, what's with the myth of this person. This, I've heard so many wild and crazy things about this man, and I've come to see him. They're not really interested in Jesus. They're just interested in being where Jesus is. I would dare say that the probably some of that crowd on that outer ring of this right here are the ones who just a few days later would be there before, um, before um, uh, the, the Roman emperor and say, crucify him. They would choose a thief over Jesus Christ, a man who had only been doing good, healing, ministering, and touching people's lives. They would choose that. I believe that's where the crowd, I'll tell you something, if we run with the crowd, we're in, we're in a desperate situation. We're in a bad place. When we find ourselves going with the flow of everybody else, we need to stop for just a moment because if, if you look at Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ did not go with the flow. But as a matter of fact, the people, many times the ones that came against him most were the religious people. And I believe that we need to understand that, that these people on the outside, uh, they're, just, they're just wanting to see what's going to happen. They're really not interested in Jesus and then I see an, another ring, a little bit closer. It, it's the people of the, the 5,000 or the 3,000. And they're the people that came and, and they're the ones that Jesus ministered to and he fed. But, but a lot of them came for the food. There's going to be food. I understand there's going to be food. Let's go over there, you know. And, and, and they weren't really interested in Jesus. They were just interested in their needs being met. I can tell you this right here as a pastor uh, over my many years of pastoring that there have been a lot of people that have come to the church and, and not ask the church for help but demand that the church help them. Uh, they said, you have, you have a responsibility to help us. And, and see, they weren't really interested in the gospel that we were preaching. They were only interested in the fact that we had some things that could meet their needs. And there's a lot of people, even in our churches today, they come to church for social things. They're really not really concerned about the word. Oh, yeah, they, they love Jesus, but they love him from the position of the 5,000. And, and they're not really looking for a, a, a real close relationship. I, sure, I want to get to heaven. I want to make sure I get there. I've got my fire insurance, uh, you know, all in line. But I'm really not looking for a close relationship with him. And I see that 5,000 out there. That next level of relationship. And then I saw something else. I, I, I thought about this, the, the 70. 
I've always loved that to end Luke about the 70, how Jesus took 70 of his disciples and, and he gave them the authority to go minister the word. And you see, I, I see them. Now, they didn't become the 12. They didn't become the 12, but they were part. They, they, they were close enough to Jesus to understand. Remember when we were teaching, we had taught this a few weeks ago about authority. And, and when Jesus um, uh, took uh, uh, the centurion and, and, and the centurion said, no, you don't have to come to my house because I'm a man of, uh, under authority. And, and these 70, I believe, understood that. They, they were close enough to Jesus that they understood that. And they had, been, they had been demonstrated through the words and the things from that anointing anointing that Jesus had put on them. But see, I believe there's even a closer relationship we can have him. See, I go from the seven to another a little bit closer, and that's the 12. And these are the guys that walked with Jesus. And they walked with him everywhere. But even in the midst of the 12, even in the midst of the 12, there was, we know, one who wasn't really interested in what he was saying, was only interested in what he could get out of it. And I thought, I thought about that. You know, here's this band of brothers. You know, many times in the ministry, uh, and we're called into the ministry, but I, I know I've had brothers in, in the Lord that supposedly called in the ministry, and, you know, they were, really interested, they were just interested in what they could do, you know, and make sure that their needs were met. And, and Jesus has a, has, a, has a word for them. He, he said, you're a hireling. See, you, you know, just here, you're just here to get what you can get. And that's a bad place to be because you're in a position, you're in a place where you ought to know more. Then I thought, you know, there's even a closer position here, and that's the three. Remember the three, Peter, James, and John, and how Jesus would draw them apart, that what they call the inner circle. And, and he, remember when he went into the garden, and this, and this, this time you're going to see that when, when he, all the disciples go and they're going to pray, and, and then he takes Peter, James, and John a little bit further down, and he said, would you pray with me, you know? And, 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 and there's, this, there's this relationship there, and, and, and of the things, the Mount of Transfiguration, all the things, the intimacy that they had. And I thought, wow, Lord, what a great place to be in that, in that relationship and in saying, you know, you know, as Peter said, he said, Lord, I don't have any other place to go. Where would I go? I'm with you. I believe that's part of that relationship that they had with him. But then I, there's one person, and I would bring it down to one more, and that relationship is one. And there's one in the Bible. I don't know if you know him, but... I love him. I love, I love his love and his compassion and devotion to Christ. You know what his name was? John. John was a younger man at that time. But you know who sat next to Jesus at the, at the, uh, the, the supper that night when they gathered together? It was, it was John. You, do you know who was the only disciple that did come to the crucifixion of Jesus? It was John. John was standing there with Mary, Jesus' mother, and, and Jesus, who had such a close relationship and fellowship with him, said, Mother, woman, your son, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. He felt so confident in that relationship that he was willing to give to this man the responsibility of the care of his mother. Do you understand that? That the... the the sense of oneness that he had. You look at John, I love, and I was sharing this Wednesday night of all of the books in the, the New Testament, and I love Paul, and you know I love Paul, I love his teachings. <clears throat> but, but the book of John, to me, if, you, if I just had one book to read in the whole Bible, it would be the book of John. Because of this right here, in that relationship that Jesus wants with everyone, it is the relationship of love. And I thought, you know, when he looked at John and he saw John, he saw someone that was close to him, that had desired to be with him. Well, who was it who, when the revelation came of what the, the world would be like at the very end? It was John, that great revelation, the revelator of John that God had given that to. I thought about that and I thought about those those. The different levels of relationship 
I truly believe that, that Jesus is a relationship person. He calls us his children, doesn't he? Amen. We're not just called servants in the house of the Lord. We're called the children of God. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that's a relationship right there, you know, and we can make that relationship just as close as we want uh, it to be there. And so as I was looking at that, I thought about that, and then I thought back to that, that saying that grace is unconditionally given. Grace is unconditionally given, but intimacy must be relentlessly pursued. I believe there is an invitation from God for every one of us, and that is to draw close to him. I believe you can be as close to God as you want to be, but it is going to take something on your part. I had someone come to me one time and, and say, boy, pastor, I'm really dry in my spiritual relationship with the Lord. You're going to have to start preaching better. And I thought, wow, I don't think I really have much to do with your relationship or your fellowship with the Lord other than just simply teaching you the word of God. But that's really between you and the Lord, isn't it? If you're in a dry place spiritually, it doesn't have anything to do with the people around you. It has everything to do with you. And we need to make sure that we, we intentionally spend that time with the Lord. I talked to uh, Wednesday night about those conversations that we have. And the first one was in, in praying, our time of prayer, spending time with the Lord, not just simply asking for things, but learning to listen to his voice. I've, I've had this question asked me many, many, many times. What is the secret to hearing, being able to hear the voice of the Lord? And really, there's only one answer to that. You just have to get before him, and you have to open your ears of your spirit, and you have to listen. You have to stop speaking. You have to stop speaking, and you just simply have to allow the Lord to speak to you. Will it be a thunderbolt? I don't know. If you do, let me know that, okay? Will it be a small, still voice? That's what my, my Bible tells me. He speaks to me in here. I, I love what Pastor Marcia said just a minute ago. You see, we're the house of God, not this building. I think if the one thing that's come out of this whole thing is this right here, is that people have come to understand that the church of God is not a building. It is the people of God. We are the temple. Doesn't Acts say that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit lives in us. But I want to draw you back for just one more moment before I close here this morning is this right here. There is no way to follow Jesus without him interfering with your life. Can I say that to you again? There is no way that you can follow very close to Jesus. And I can tell you this right here. When you want to follow really close, there's a lot of interfering. There's a lot of changing. I know that before I came into the ministry, I struggled with this because I had a dream, a vision of what I wanted to do with my life. And the Lord said, no, I have a vision and I have a plan and a purpose, and this is what I want you to do. And I can tell you that I struggle with that. But as I've come closer and closer to him, I'm able to say what Jesus said to the Father. Don't you know in that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was before the Lord, do you think he wanted to go to the cross? Do you think he wanted to be beaten with an inch of his life? Do you think he wanted to be chained to that pole and beaten with that whip of cat and nine tails? Do you believe Jesus was really looking forward to that? There was so much pressure on him. The Bible said literally he began to, 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 to sweat drops of blood. But he said this, Lord... Father God, not my will, but your will be done. I see that in Paul. I see that in people that decide to become the one with Jesus, that one to draw to the inner circle and become that one. Lord, not my will. This is what I plan. This is what I want to do. But no, Lord, I, don't, I, I lay all of that aside. I, as Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me and pressing onto the mark of the high calling of God that's in my life. We have to be willing to say to the Lord, not my will, but your will be done in my life. Your will, your plan, your purpose in my life. When Jesus looks at us, and I always think about this about the, the rich young ruler, 
is that when he looked at him, he didn't look at the accomplishments that he'd had. He didn't look at the law that he had kept. He looked at his heart. And this morning, I've asked the Holy Spirit to do this. I've asked the Holy Spirit to look into your heart. I've asked him to search your heart, each one of us, that we would be willing to say, Lord, what do you see when you look at me? What would Jesus say to you if he were standing here right now? I've heard that, I've heard people say, Jesus has piercing blue eyes, you know. Well, my mother-in-law used to have piercing brown eyes. I didn't want to get around those eyes, you know. But I can tell you, if Jesus were to look at you today and he looks at you with love, please understand that. Anything that Jesus does, he does with love. What would he see? Is there something that is between you and him? Is there something that is keeping you from coming in to that place of an intimate relationship with the Lord. It's not about going to church. We don't go to church to get brownie points. You know, say, Lord, I've, I went to church this many times. We go to church to fellowship with other Christians. We go to church to hear the word of God. We go to church to get prepared to take the word of God into the world that we live in. We have a sign out here. And that sign says this right here. Now, ministry begins when you walk out those doors. But if you've not spent time with him, if you don't have that intimate relationship with him, what do you have? What do you have to give to the world out there? I hear so many people today, they're so concerned about the virus and all of this and and there's fear and, and just all kinds of things that are being said. And, and I thought, you know, Lord, I have nothing but peace in my heart. I, I know that when I, I dwell next to you, when I dwell in your presence, even though the enemy may try to come at you, I can dwell in your presence. And your peace and your rest and your comfort is there over me. I don't have to be anxious. That's one of the things we've been telling everybody in our church as we've called. We've called everybody in the church. We call you, and I hope you don't get tired of us calling because we, we love you. We're checking on you. We want to make sure that you're all right, you know. But you just need to know that there is no need that he cannot meet in your life. There is no area that he cannot touch in your life. I thought about this uh, Someone made this statement, and I did just a couple minutes here. There's a book, it's called Not a Fan, but Becoming Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. And the, they, the, the author of that book makes this statement, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. I don't know where you are spiritually. But if you're in that position, I'm going to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to come out of the crowd. Come out of the crowd. Come on past the, the 5,000 of just having your needs met. Come on past the 70 who just understood authority and power. Come on down to the 12. Come on down to the 3. Come on down to the 1. Because the 1 is is the relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. I pray for each one of you that there, you would not just be someone who is following afar off, but that you would come to him. There's no area in your life that he can't touch. There's no, there's no addiction that he can't uh, set you free from. There's no fear that he cannot bring peace into that situation. There's nothing in our life, nothing in our life that that intimacy with Jesus cannot change. So, Father, I pray, Lord, right now for each one that are listening. I pray for them, Lord, you draw them in. You said this right here, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened. 
and I will give you rest. Many times, four, five, six times throughout the word of God, Jesus is always saying, come, come. So today is your day. You can bow your head right now and say, Lord Jesus, I come into the presence of this word and of the spirit of God, and I come into the presence of Jesus, accepting him not only as the need meter in my life, as someone who will meet my needs, but as someone who I want to have a fellowship, an intense in, in intimate relationship with, to know you. Thank you, Jesus, as we open up our hearts to you that you will minister and, and, uh, and touch lives today. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Now, I want to just say just a couple of things here, uh, a couple of things that we're going to be doing uh, in the church next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday is Easter. And um, we have permission to uh, hold a drive-in church service. So next Sunday at 10 o'clock out here in our parking lot, we're going to ask you to come. We're going to have things for the kids that they can do in the car. Or, or you can sit outside the car if you want to bring chairs. You can't sit near one another. You can't get, we're going to social distance. But we're going to give you an opportunity to come. Maybe you just need to say hi to some people, you know. Let them know that they're, they're there and you're okay, you know, and all that. But, but we're going to come and we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to come and celebrate Easter. I'm inviting you to come, 10 o'clock, next Sunday morning, out here in the parking lot. Come and worship the Lord with us. We're going to be magnifying. We're going to be singing. I'm sure we're going to be um, getting into all of the homes around here, so they'll, they'll get to hear the worship too. That's okay. For an hour, we're going to make Easter what God has called it to be or Resurrection Sunday. I actually like that. I don't like actually Easter, but that's what the world calls it. But I call it the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection day. It's the day that Jesus brought that hope into the world. So I invite you. That's next Sunday. We're located at 700 Booties Crossing Road in Georgetown. And um, just come down Williams Drive. You get to the Walgreens there. Uh, go west or turn left if you're coming from the interstate. And you'll see us down there. We're right past the school, big church building there. Uh, we want to invite you to come and be a part. We pray for you. We want you to know that we pray for you each and every day. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. We're looking forward to seeing each one of you, you know, and to being able to say hi other than just on the phone. God bless you. We love you. Have a blessed week. And remember, we're the head, not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We're blessed coming in and we're blessed going out. And everything that we put our hands to is blessed of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. All right. God bless.